All right, well, good morning. All right, y'all go get a little coffee. You got to get going here. This is a, it's supposed to be a dialogue, right? That's what we're going to have. So everybody wake up. You know, I'll try not to put you to sleep here early this morning, but um, it was a great day yesterday. I sat in the morning sessions and just enjoyed the, the data that was presented. Joe's presentation was fantastic, I thought. Um, and, I, and I know we've got a great set of panels today, and I appreciate all of you being here to participate in that dialogue. Before I introduce the, the first panel, um, I kind of want to share my perspective a little bit on NASA's workforce um, and the importance of a strong STEM pipeline to, to our future here at NASA. And it's really not just NASA, it's our partners in industry and, and all, the, all the folks that you guys provide the workforce to. Um, I have a kind of a personal note around this. I have two daughters um, and, and I have quite a bit of passion around this topic because uh, my daughters are now out of college and out, out in the workforce, um, fortunately. Uh, one, is, one is a nurse and one is a microbiologist. Um, my, my, the microbiologist, though, she should have been an engineer. Um, and, and, and I struggle with this because I watched this process trying not to influence, uh, trying very hard to let her make her own decisions um, and trying to help her. But, but here's a young lady that, that went into chemical engineering, started in chemical engineering. And, you know, we heard yesterday we really need to focus on math. Well, she, she blew all three calculuses that we have to take as engineers away with a 98 average by the time she got done with all three. But she ran into the look to your left, look to your right, and only one of you is going to survive. And none of the people to her left or right were, were girls, right? She, so she switched to microbiology, which ended up being great, by the way, because she found out quite a bit of passion there. But what I remember her talking about was her two professors that she loved the most were both female, right? And she found a connection with them. And, that, and they helped her, they got her internships, they, they, they kind of mentored her through this, and now she's, like I said, she's out in the, out in the world working in that, in that field. Just awesome, right, from that perspective. Now, my daughter, the, the one that's the, uh, the nurse, ran up against another activity. Now, ner those of you that have kids that have gone to nursing school, nursing school is pretty competitive. Um, I was a little surprised at how competitive it was. I still consider that a science field based on the classes she took. They were a lot harder than what I took in engineering. Um, at least I thought they were. Um, but she got to that point here, you, you applied for nursing school as a, ju a, a rising junior, right? And, and what was interesting was to get in there, you had, to, you had to be pretty good. She had a 365 GPA, right? In fact, I was picking on her about why don't you just try to go to med school? Not in her DNA, but that's what she, but I was picking on her. Um, but after her first semester, she got to the second semester and she ran into the infamous weed out class. Right, and, I, and, and I'm not worried about the weed out class. I heard that yesterday, we, we, need to, we need to be careful about what we're doing there. But what I remember her saying was, and it, and it struck me, she says, Dad, they make it so hard to get in, why don't they want, us to, want to keep us? Why are they trying to weed us out? So I think that's just something we ought to be all thinking about um, as, we, as we move forward. I, I, it, that's why it resonated with Joe's pitch yesterday, you know, that we've gotten outstanding at driving people out instead of outstanding keeping people in. So I think that's, that's enough of my personal yakking for the moment, but I, I do have a, quite a bit of passion around that. And so we're, here at NASA, we're just perfect, and we don't have any issues. It's all you guys in the <laughs> academic, <laughs> academic arena. Um, but I, would, I thought I would share some of the challenges and, and the opportunities I think we have um, at NASA. My, my job as the associate administrator, which means nothing to most people, is I'm actually the COO for the agency. So I, I, on the day-to-day -day basis, I worry about performance of missions, spacecraft, launch vehicles, and then the institution. How are we doing from an institutional perspective? So I spend a lot of time with Brenda's shop and the folks in, in our human capital shop worrying about the diversity and, and following along with where we are. And you saw from David yesterday that, that we got a lot of work to do. Um, and here's kind of a by the numbers, just in case you, you don't know where we are. We have roughly 17,500 folks in the agency, okay? Um, about 63% of those are science and engineers, okay? So 23% of those are minority. And, and when you look at that um, compared to a, a U.S. population, we're about the same in those similar positions, but the, work for, but the total workforce in the country is about 36% uh, 30, minority. So we got a little work to do to get more, more indicative of what the, what the workforce in the country looks like. In the scientist, that's in engineering. In the scientist category, um, we're not doing so well in the physical science compared to what's out in the real world. So we got a lot of work to do in these areas. And these guys bring me, the, <laughs> Brenda Shop brings me that data every quarter. Um, 
and, and it doesn't move very fast because we don't hire, we, we roughly hire 600 folks a year in the agency. And of that, about 300 are what we call new hires, or, or early career hires, folks that come from your institutions or have just one or two years in, in, the, in the business. The other thing that, that worries me a little bit when we talk about what we're trying to do from an agency perspective is actually the demographics from an age perspective of where we are. Um, of the 17,500, um, 15,600 roughly are at what we call GS-12 or higher. Now GS-12 for us is probably the start of your journeyman level, and it's usually, I would say, um, probably mid-career, mid-level career. So that leaves only like 1,800 folks that are early career. That's a kind of going out of business strategy, and that's why this pipeline to me is so important, right? It's making sure not only do we have a pipeline generically, but do we have a pipeline that actually represents, is representative of this country and what this country looks like. That's really important to us. So yesterday, Joe talked a little bit about, from, from an academic perspective, the faculty members, those frontline faculty members are kind of the folks that, that ensure that from an academic institution perspective. That's where you, those are your touch points to the students, the first, the first place you get to. For me, it's our branch chiefs. Um, and when I look at the diversity in my branch chiefs, amazingly, it's 75% white, 25% minority, right? Well, if you, if you listened at all to Joe's presentation yesterday and the kind of things that can drive, wow, we got a lot of work to do to make sure we're working on the unconscious bias that people could have because amazingly, our branch chiefs the first line supervisors look a lot like the workforce from that perspective. So we're digging into that. We've had a lot of, we've had a lot of work around that. We actually had several um, focus groups where Alma, y'all all heard from Alma yesterday, we, she came in and helped us with some focus groups about what's happening in that arena. What, what are people thinking? And, and it's all, that's what's so important for us is to always have that awareness and in, in where we're moving forward. The last thing that, that, that I wanted to point out before I let Donald take over is, you know, there's lots of, lots of uh, if you could put a cartoon up here, you would show a pipeline, right? And you could show lots of leaks in that pipeline. And where are those leaks occurring? And so we all have ownership of a, of a different hole that we got to patch, um, is the way I put it. You know, there's middle school where we find that we really, is a, is a great touch point for us as a country to grab that STEM workforce. There's, there's high school where we keep them interested. There's college where you guys, where you guys really grab onto them and keep them involved. But even in our part, our big challenge is once we get folks at the GS-12 level, we lose them. We have, a, we have a hole in that pipeline right there. And so again, Alma's been helping us with what's going on with that, that location. A lot of people don't tell us why they leave, right? We don't, we don't have any way to really force them. Uh, that would probably be, I'd probably get in trouble if we did that. Um, but it is a way for us to try to understand what are we doing as an, as an institution, the institution NASA, to, to force people to go out. And we, and we do lose, especially women, we lose women at a higher rate at that level than, than, than others. So we got our own challenges we're working on. Um, but the bottom line is this, you know, that whole pipeline, we're all partners in this. You know, you guys have the supply, we have the demand um, from a, just an economics perspective. And, and what we want is to make sure that supply is, is consistent and representative of this country. Um, and that's what we're working on in the agency. And I think as long as we stay integrated, I mean, this kind of session of sessions of sharing promising practices and things you guys are doing here just in these two days is huge. I mean, it's, it takes great steps because you're sharing, you're getting to talk. I bet you there's more work going on outside here around the coffee pot than there is here in the auditorium, right? That's what's important um, because you guys are gonna provide us that workforce um, that we need to meet the challenges we're trying to do. I mean, we're not, we're not trying to do anything hard. We're only trying to go to Mars, right? <laughs> we're only trying to, do, to find out if there's life out there somewhere. Simple challenges that we have every day, right? And you guys are, you guys are growing that workforce that we need to make those challenges, challenges uh, real, right? As, as, as Charlie liked to say, we're, we're, we're trying to make the impossible possible, right? And it takes a pretty strong workforce to go do that. So. Anyway, that's what we're going to talk about today. You're going to hear a lot about that pipeline. You're going to hear a lot about what we need. And, and with that, I'm going to sit down and hush and let our Associate Administrator for Education, Donald James, I think several of you probably know him, since he runs the MURAP, the EPSCOR, the SEEP, the Space Grant, all the different pieces in his portfolio. He's got a great panel today. And I, again, I look forward to you guys really participating. Um, yesterday afternoon, I heard was a fantastic from a participatory perspective. So don't just sit there, engage, right, and work with these guys. So Donald, you got it. Go. We certainly appreciate your leadership and support of NASA education and all you're doing to position the agency to execute on our grand missions for the future. 
Um, I'd like to start by uh, a, a bit of a note that we will be taking questions later in this panel of discussion, both from the audience and the online viewers. Uh, for the online viewers, I understand you'll see something on the, on the, uh, the, the chart uh, later. It's, uh, uh, you can submit it through civilrightsinfo at nasa.gov. Uh, and if you're unable to get to your question today, we'll follow up with you after the event. Um, I thought I would start uh, by, I know you've probably all had your coffee, but in case your brain hasn't really kicked in to sort of anchor today, I thought we would start with a bit of trivia just so that you can remember your session. So if you happen to be 48 years old and your birthday was yesterday, then you were born when NASA launched its Pioneer Venus probe to Venus. And if you were 37 years old and you, then you were born when NASA launched SCS-28, which was Space Shuttle Columbia's 30th shuttle mission, and the commander was Brewster Shaw on that, and for extra credit, I don't know if we have any 32-year-olds in the audience. I think there's a lot of you out there. Um, if so, then uh, on this date in history, 32 years ago, a woman actually made space history. Does anybody know what that was? I didn't know either until I Googled it. Uh, it was uh, Svetlana Savitskaya, who was the first woman to perform an EVA uh, from the Russians off of Space Station, three and a half hour EVA. So there you have it, this date in history. Um, also for you trivia buffs, this happens to be the date uh, when 42 years ago, Gerald Ford uh, assumed the presidency after President Nixon resigned. And so there you have another uh, trivia question there. Uh, now that you are awake and fully mentally engaged, see Dr. Ward is a psychologist, so she knows about this anchoring stuff, right? <laughs> so. Uh, I'm really delighted to participate in this uh, critically important conversation that we're having, and I'm honored to be representing the women and men of NASA education who are dedicated uh, to advancing high-quality STEM education using NASA's unique assets, which is what our mission is in NASA education. And our session this morning is looking at the workforce of the future, uh, particularly at NASA. So I'd like to frame our discussion with a couple of what I believe are givens. First, the word workforce that we use is just a term that means people. And it's always about the people. In fact, the very purpose of NASA education is to ensure that we have people to make today's vision possible for tomorrow's NASA. And when NASA talks about tomorrow, it's like the opposite of dog years. We talk in terms of three to four decades. So it's really all about the people. It's not about machines or computers or cool gadgets or rovers or telescopes, science instruments, thermal vac chambers, wind tunnels, or anything like that. Because the truth is absolutely nothing, none of these things magically appear out of thin air. I mean, even if HAL 9000 were to roll in here right now and says, you can be replaced, Mr. Moderator, the first question I'm going to ask is, well, who programmed you? So it's really all about the people. Another given is that in 20 to 40 years, about the time horizon for humans on Mars, a significant percentage of all jobs and professions probably do not exist now. And many professions may have withered away. I mean, is anybody building Selectric's typewriters anymore? And in the age of driverless vehicles, I'm not sure I want to grow up to be a truck driver or an Uber driver. The final given I'll posit is that the demographics of those who will be doing anything at NASA or other s and type agencies, government or industry, won't be like it is today and for sure won't be like it was during the heyday of Apollo. It's not only inevitable, but we know it's better for the agency and for the nation. So how does that inform the question of what type of education, what type of training, skill development, disciplinary studies should students pursue today to be effective tomorrow. So this morning we are honored to have four extraordinary individuals who will add their knowledge and experience to this conversation. I'm going to quickly introduce them first and then ask that they take five minutes to just sum up their dissertation. And then we'll dive a bit deeper into the question of preparing students for tomorrow's challenge, particularly at NASA, and perhaps pr probe a bit on this STEM thing that we keep talking about. At the end, we're going to reserve time for some questions and answers. So first, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Wanda Ward. 
who is the Assistant Director for Broadening Participation at the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. You might have heard of that place. She's on loan from the National Science Foundation. Dr. Ward has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Princeton University and a doctorate in psychology from Stanford University. So we're really honored to have you today, Dr. Ward. Thank you. I'd also like to welcome my colleague, uh, Jill Prince, who serves as the manager of the NASA Engineering Safety Center Integration Office. Now, for those of you that don't understand NASA speak, let me help you with that. So if you remember the 1980s Hanes underwear commercials where Inspector 12 said they don't say Hanes until I say they say Hanes? Well, Jill is like our Inspector 12. We don't say rocket good until she say we say rocket good. <laughs> Ms. Prince earned her undergraduate degree in physics and astronomy from Northwestern University and a master's in mechanical engineering from George Washington University. Thank you, Jill, for being here. Then I'd like to introduce Ms. Susan Fonseca Lanham. She's the founder and CEO of Women at the Frontier. Women at the Frontier is a convergence of female innovators from around the world unleashing exponential impact through cutting edge science, technology, policy, and entrepreneurship. That's pretty amazing. I mean, if she actually accomplishes all that, our problems are solved. She's a founding member of Singularity University located at NASA Research Park, which is adjacent to our Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley. She has degrees in anthropology and law, and actually more importantly, she's a dear friend and colleague, and so thank you very much for being here, Susan. I'm also pleased to introduce another colleague, Mr. Dennis Woodfork. Dennis is the Assistant Division Chief for Technology at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He leads the division's strategy development for technologies including spacecraft guidance, navigation and control, systems engineering, in-space propulsion, and space situational awareness. Now again, let me give you my NASA translator on that. So, do you remember those commercials where Larry Bird and Michael Jordan, they were fighting over who's gonna have the Big Mac, you know, and they had a basketball shoot off and everything, and, and they had all this contest, and the first one to miss was the one who had to, you know, watch the other person eat the hamburger, and so there's like, you know, off the expressway, across the billboard, you know, and they, and they never would miss and everything. Well, he's in charge of making sure we don't miss when we go out into orbit, around the Van Allen belts, around the moon, through a couple of asteroids, and make it onto a planet precisely where we said we were gonna do it. That's kind of what he does. I'd rather be Michael Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and the Air Force Institute of Technology. A little military double dipping there, I see. He has a B.S. degree in aerospace engineering and an M.S. in astronautical engineering. He also has earned an MBA from the University of Maryland. So clearly a group of underachievers. I apologize for that. Uh, at the end of our session, uh, I'm going to ask uh, my colleague from Human Resources, Mr. Keith Lowe, who's in charge of the Pathways Program. And if you're interested in, well, how do you actually get a job at NASA? How do you get interns and all of that? We heard a little bit from my colleague, Carolyn Knowles, yesterday. And so uh, Keith is going to expand on that and tell you everything you need to know. So if you're from a university, you can tell your students and all that stuff. So with that, um, I, the, each of the panelists know they have five minutes to present the summary of their dissertation. And so we'll do the qualifying exams after that. And we're going to start with Dr. Ward. And thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Donald. One of the things that uh, he pointed out to us uh, in preparation was that we needed to have fun up here. And so you set the stage for that. I think we'll have a good engagement this morning. Very pleased to be here and want to commend NASA for your uh, persistent uh, demonstrated leadership and enthusiasm. As was mentioned by uh, Tina Chen yesterday, you continue to stand strong in the federal and national enterprise. And, and, and I'm pleased to be here this morning. Uh, somehow my slides, uh, I think, are these your slides then? All right. I can do Dennis's slide, we're, we're, and there will be a quiz after our panel this morning, so stay with us. Basically, uh, what I'd like uh, briefly within my five minutes uh, to uh, share with you uh, is a continuation of part of the discussion that Jo Handelsman had on yesterday in her keynote, and that is to express uh, the administration's uh, assertive, aggressive, and, and determined um, 
uh, commitment in this area of diversity and inclusion across the STEM enterprise, including um, the uh, NASA mission, as it were. Many of you are aware of the Ed Educate to Innovate uh, campaign that the president undertook starting in 2009. Uh, parts of that include makers movement, entre uh, inclusive entrepreneurism, et cetera. And as Joe Handelsman spoke about yesterday, uh, the STEM for All initiative, and, and I work within that space uh, as part of her team. She talked about active learning, she talked about course access, the image of STEM, uh, and she spoke about bias in STEM. And I'll mention briefly, uh, because as, as was mentioned, that report is yet uh, forthcoming. We are anxious to have that out and to share with you. But OSTP and the Office of Personnel Management uh, established an interagency part, uh, policy group uh, last year, uh, last November, uh, December, comprised of 15 federal agencies, several uh, executive offices of the president, and some of the things that we have looked at during the course of that work, I will not report out the recommendations, obviously, but some of the things that we've taken a look at are evidence-based best practices, promising practices, emerging practices along a broad swath of uh, topics, including the organizational cycle of recruitment, hiring, and promotion, uh, a more holistic approach uh, that we uh, took a look across the participating agencies, uh, topics of compliance, about which you've heard uh, quite a bit over the past uh, day uh, going forth. NASA has distinguished itself uh, uh, among the federal agencies with regard to the mission STEM activities, the resources that have been put forward, the site visits, et cetera, that have taken place. And many of the participating agencies learned quite a bit uh, from NASA. As you might imagine, with all topics, there are some high performers at one end and some that are not quite so high performing. But the process was such that there was quite a bit of cross-fertilization of ideas, and again, uh, NASA rose uh, to the challenge quite well. In addition to recruitment and hiring, compliance kinds of things, we spent a lot of time talking about the merit review process, the hallmark of uh, making uh, federally funded um, um, awards and the like, uh, research development and intervention kinds of activities, including uh, my home institution, NSF's advanced program, or the science of broadening participation portfolio. Again, our approach was to take an evidence-based, science-informed uh, approach to the recommendations that are coming out. Those recommendations uh, address uh, issues at federal-specific, at agency-specific levels, at government-wide levels. For example, one of the things at the government-wide level we recognize the need for are metrics and strategies that will help us track diversity and inclusion in the federal workforce including barriers such as explicit and implicit bias. And we're also making some recommendations for federally funded institutions of higher education in the bias mitigation space. And so uh, we, as, as, as we said, uh, we look forward to sharing with this community in particular, but all of the participating agencies uh, when that work comes forward. One of the things we were sure is that there is no silver bullet and so there's not a sort of cookie cutter, cookie, uh, what do you call it, cookie cutter uh, approach that, um, that one uh, uh, might uh, undertake. And then what I would have talked about at, in my slide, and, and perhaps I can during the uh, course of the conversation, is what I would call empowering a diverse and innovative ecosystem of learning. And basically we're talking about intentional strategies and approaches and working with communities rather than on communities uh, to achieve the uh, NASA mission. Uh, I believe I'm out of time, is that correct? Well, as a good NASA person, I've built in some schedule margin, so you're doing great, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, but with regard to this ecosystem approach, and, and NASA engages in this to some extent, as do many other uh, federal agencies, but I was very impressed with the First morning's panel yesterday, uh, the initiative that was shown by the various professional associations that said, we would like for you all to work with us, but we're getting this together ourselves, the coalition building. 
And we're very interested in this notion of uh, community engagement, normally with uh, 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 government, university, community partnerships, but not exclusively. The informal uh, science education arena, um, uh, uh, philanthropies, whatever uh, it takes to make a, a community uh, thrive. And we recommend, as NASA is doing to some extent, that the communities that you thrive with, through, and for uh, lift up and ratchet up this ecosystem approach uh, so that the efforts can be accelerated uh, much more quickly so that we'll have a fighting chance uh, to beat the rate that uh, David Newman talked about. It would be the 22nd century if we keep going the pace at which we're going. So these elemental approaches are extremely important. They are necessary, but they are not sufficient. So in, in addition to place-based approaches, some of the core foundational needs in this kind of space would be, uh, to some extent, reconceptualization of education, that is, out-of-school time learning, but the sustainable infrastructure to leverage community resources, building a cycle of trust in the communities with which we work public engagement, and appropriate communication, appropriate language for communicating with our respective stakeholders around, he, around these issues. Some of you may have heard of anchor institutions, and these are institutions, I think some 600 um, uh, participants strong, that characterize themselves as enduring organizations that remain in their geographic spaces and play integral role in their local communities and economies. And uh, many of us are giving far more serious thought uh, to these kinds of ecosystems that need to uh, be borne out. Uh, coming along with that would be coherence and coordination uh, uh, among actors for maximum impact. And with finally, my final comment is that with visions, with strategies, that must include intellectual, societal, and democratic advancement for these kinds of partnerships and innovation uh, and learning ecosystems about which I'm speaking. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. I appreciate it. I'd like to now turn it over to my colleague, Jill Prince. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I believe the challenge in increasing the diversity in NASA's workforce does not begin when the advertisement goes out the door. I think there's a lot of work that has to happen in the off season in order to um, have a diverse pool of candidates from which to choose. So how do you do that? Um, it begins in grade schools, uh, quite honestly. Uh, it, it's up to the engineers at NASA and the scientists and, and everybody who's part of the NASA team to go out and inspire the, the youth to get into the STEM fields. And it's not necessarily something you can do by solving equations. I mean, there, there's something else. Um, when you look at the college environment, the incoming freshmen who want to be engineers and scientists, there's a quite a large percentage that are minorities and women. But if you look at the graduating class, it drops like a rock. And so why does that happen? It, it's not ability, it's interest. So how do we keep the interest peaked um, throughout the growth years um, and as you're developing and becoming an engineer? So when I look back, uh, my technical career to date, um, one thing that I can note that was one of my most, what I look most favorably upon is the Mars Phoenix landing. Uh, I spent a lot of my career in the Mars program and the entry, descent, and landing community. But when I look back on landing, helping to land Mars Phoenix, what I don't think about is optimizing trajectories. That's not what gets my heart rate going. What I think about is that community of people across the country who helped make that happen. So I think about working with at least four different centers. I know they're more involved, um, but my personal interaction was with four different centers, getting to know all those people, getting to know how they worked, what made them tick, and then bringing them all together in the last minutes before um, watching Phoenix land. Now when Phoenix was landing, they had a communication sequence, and in every successful piece of that entry, descent, and landing, we would hear whether or not it was successful or, it was successful or not. And so everybody was getting a little more excited as, as the seconds ticked by. And you know, the parachute inflated. Yeah, you know, you're trying to hold it in because it's, it's still not on the ground. 
and you get to um, all these different pieces, and when it finally landed on the ground, I was sitting at the console at, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and watching the telemetry come in. And when we got that call that Phoenix had landed successfully, the room exploded. I mean, with the emotion and everybody, there were high fives, there was hugging, there was crying. And I'm looking around, I'm like, there's no crying in baseball, right? There's, like, like, wait a second, we are scientists and engineers, but seeing that that bigger picture, that small, what you think of as a small contribution and deriving those equations and solving those equations and creating that CFD model and all of those small pieces come together as one, when you see all these people together, it's emotional and it's, it's awesome, it was confusing, it was surprising, but it was awesome. And that's what I think about when I think of STEM. Is, is being a part of the bigger picture. And I think that's what you can use to inspire younger people to get involved. You're not gonna throw a heat transfer equation at somebody and be like, look how awesome this is. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, don't get me wrong, there's that aha moment of finally understanding it and getting it, and, and that's really awesome. Um, and you can communicate that too. But it's the, it's the bigger picture and working together and working across centers, working across all the traditional boundaries, working um, with people and getting to know them that really makes that difference. And I think it's up to us, everybody, I, I personally, sorry, take a responsibility to go out to the schools and tell them it's more than the numbers. It's the numbers, but it's more than the numbers um, that will help get more people involved because it takes all different types of people. It takes STEM, it takes non-STEM, it takes everybody and everybody's a piece of that bigger picture. So. Yeah, I'm reminded about the, what was it, the title of Lance Armstrong's first book, It's Not About the Bike, you know, and here's a person who made his career riding a bike, mm -hmm. uh, but yet that's sort of the same thing, you know, it's not necessarily about the computations or whatever it is, and, and yet if without that, mm -hmm. we wouldn't get there, but it's all the stuff that you mentioned. And it so. starts early. You've got to understand your contribution as a whole yeah. at a young age. Yeah. And, and you have to understand that you can make a difference by doing lots of different things. Yeah. And numbers, they can be very, very cool when put in a, you know, right when context. you can see what they're doing. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jill. I appreciate that. And so, Susan, you're about changing the world and having <laughs> women do that. Um, so how do we get those kinds of moments that Jill's talking about among a broader yeah. group of people? Yeah, thank you, Donald. And Um, good morning and buenos días a todos, a los latinos y latinas científicos que están aquí. Um, it's, it's a pleasure being here and we're talking about minorities, so I got to uh, present also my, my other heritage. Um, I really like this question about pipeline because, um, and, and that NASA is taking such a leadership role in uh, science and technology. Um, and when you talk about STEM, I like to call it science, technology, entrepreneurship, and music because those are my passions, so I've kind of changed <laughs> STEM a little bit. Um, but my world is about um, leveraging exponential technologies. And uh, yesterday, I really appreciated Dr. David Newman talking about um, why are we going so slow? And uh, she really wants to see a step change. And since I'm in the business of exponentials and we only have five minutes, I'm going to try to you know, accelerate how I present and maybe hit escape velocity and how we can go a little bit faster. Um, but I think that, um, you know, this is an issue nationally and globally about getting more women uh, and minorities involved in science and tech and, and how do we do that practically? So I'm going to come at it from, from where I'm at, which is startups led by women um, that are looking to solve global grand challenges, poverty, water, Um, global health, you know, pandemic, cybersecurity issues, space issues. And, uh, and I like to do that through sharing some examples of what's worked. Um, so in 2009, uh, this new idea, new concept, Singularity University came about and um, was presented to some key leadership at NASA, including Donald James, who helped us negotiate the collaboration and the partnership agreement. Seven years later, we are now, uh, have graduated alumni in over 70 countries, uh, over 3,000 uh, students. Um, and the idea was, at the time, to bring together the world's next generation of global leaders, to have an immersive experience on what uh, is happening from the cutting edge builders and inventors in AI, robotics, stem cells, 3D printing, biotech, nanotech, networks and computing, 
also to have another immersive experience in the global grand challenges of today. Um, and to put it all together in a 10-week program, and at the end, these uh, 80 students from around the world had to design a solution, a startup, an idea that would impact a billion people in 10 years, leveraging exponential tech. And space was at the front and center of this conversation. Um, what has happened is this partnership with unlikely collaborators that, thank you, Donald, and several of your peers uh, uh, encouraged us and made happen, has created such an interest, such a wave, such an awareness, and a ripple effect that now we've had teams that have designed uh, initiatives that are impacting the space field, the space industry, space science, space exploration. Um, two of them in particular, Moon Express, uh, which is, will be the first private uh, company to go to the moon next year, um, has obviously a collaboration partnership support from NASA. Uh, the other one is Made in Space. Our students in 2010 uh, pitched the idea of putting a 3D printer on the moon to 3D print everything the astronaut would need um, and build and manufacture in space. Now they've done it twice now. They've sent a 3D printer on the moon. They have a great collaboration with NASA. Um, it's, they've brought teams, they're, they're Series A and B funded, they've brought other teams, they've created such an interest and awareness. So this collaboration with unlikely collaborators you think uh, are unlikely actually has created some of the pipeline that you're looking for. Um, it's also brought in incredible women from other areas, design thinking, um, neurobiologists, neuroscientists, um, uh, lawyers, uh, that are so enthused about being collaborators. One, um, Shauna Panja, Panja that you know, who is an incredible citizen scientist uh, now, has come at it from being a doctor to now um, working with several projects, Project Possum, Project Phenom, Sea Exploration, and really being incredibly involved. And she's become a role model for young girls um, that can also be part and contribute to uh, the scientific exploration field. Um, so the other one was when you also supported us uh, to launch Women at the Frontier. And at the idea, it was this question, where are the women? Where are the Einsteins around the world that are women? The Ada Lovelaces, the Marie Curies, the Grace Hoppers. Um, you know, where are these incredible women, the Mae Jemisons, but in every country around the world that are really breaking new ground and that have an incredible impact to everyone? Um, and so when we came to you and, and the folks at NASA and said we want to launch global gatherings, the gatherings here and around the world, to identify, to find not only the role models of the past and the current contemporaries that are doing incredible things and are launching new companies, but who are the next? Who are the up and coming that we should have uh, our eyes and ears on the ground for them to support them with collaboration, with funding, with access to mentors, to, to really help them get a leg up, to advance quickly um, their success. Um, you know, and so you also said, yes, let's, let's collaborate, let me support this endeavor. And now, you know, five years later, we've been to three continents, 10 countries, we've, we've created a global index identifying these incredible pioneers. Um, uh, you know, and, and why, why is that important? You know, we heard yesterday this whole conversation about role models, but where are they? How do you find them? And uh, where are the role models that look like you? Where are the next role models that we need to nurture? So right now, and I invite everyone here, uh, Women at the Frontier has a survey out this month um, called um, you know, Space Trailblazers. Help us nominate your female space pioneer. And just in the one week we've had it out, it's been incredible to see the nominees that, that have, the nominations that have come forward. And women that most of us have never heard of, but that's what's fantastic, is they're being nominated by people outside of the industry of space and people inside the, the space industry, um, which, is, which is really incredible because, again, we're trying to create a whole community um, that can collaborate and support each other. So I would say this, this collaboration with Unlikely Players, I mean, right now we had the uh, Women at NASA Lego set. Uh, I don't know if most of you are familiar with that, but you know, it got such an incredible uh, support on social media. And of course, I uh, um, and my company and several organizations helped tweet it and, and reshare on Facebook, and it got over 10,000 likes, which allowed it to now be on the Lego 
project staff to, to create these Lego sets, and they're going to be five women that have really broken ground in space, including Mae Jemison and Sally Ride. And, and, and it's the idea of these are collaborators also for NASA. This is where you can get the pipeline. Um, citizen scientist is, is a great way of accessing the community because these are individuals that may not be in science and tech, or maybe they are, but they just want to be part of research and projects. And they can really create the ripple effect and expand the ecosystem. Um, so I'm really in, um, supportive of that because it also brings another point that was brought up yesterday, is the models of work and the structures of work for women and minorities. And I, I can talk about women, moms, I'm a new mommy, very happy about that, and Latina. And a lot of the old structures um, don't work for us. And they're not gonna work for the future workforce either, uh, in particular millennials, but certainly individuals that have, uh, have a caretaker role um, what we're looking at is more flexibility in the work, more uh, use of technology that allows us to be engaged um, at work, more uh, virtual work. And uh, the, the World Economic Forum uh, sent out this report about what the future of work is going to look like. Uh, and the future of work is cybersecurity issues, nanotechnology, biotech, genetics, AI, robotics, but it's also flexible work environment. It's work from home. It's allowing teams to be creative, to be nimble, um, and to still be acknowledged. Uh, you know, um, it's ideas that also come from incredible mompreneurs that are out there. And they want to be part of the NASA workforce. So it's creating uh, the avenues and the uh, structures where you can engage with the outside community. Um, it's also about bringing your target audience to the table. I think this conversation is fantastic, and I really appreciate the summit. And I'm looking forward to next summit, uh, next year, Mission STEM Summit 2, um, where we could then invite the, the people that we're trying to reach, which is we're trying to reach girls, kids, women, minorities. So it would be great if the next event actually has these people, and they are co-creators in the solutions. You know, at universities, it's really great that we have the deans here and the faculty. Um, maybe we could reverse that model and actually hear from the students themselves, the women and minorities, and say, what solution would you have? What would you propose is the answer to keep you engaged? Uh, what, you know, what, what, what grant would you like us to go after that would keep you in there? So similar for kids, let's ask them, because they're so creative and so smart. You know, what's the answer for you? What would you like to see? And let's maybe flip, flip the model and have them on stage and hear from them. And then we are the ones that make it happen. We are the guides. Um, you know, NASA and these organizations, you guys have the money. The number one barrier for women to enter as to create startups or to level up their existing companies or moms to engage is money, is funding. Um, and women and Latinas, we know what to do with money. <laughs> but um, so just give it to us. But you know, it, it's this idea of you guys can also take an incredibly active role of who gets the funding. And a lot of change and disruption comes from outside the industry, outside of what you're trying to do, um, from from new taking risks. And I know at NASA, I, I get it that you know failure is not an option because you're sending people out of space. But in this conversation of, of STEM, you know, Dr. Ellen Stofan talked about normalizing uh, this conversation of diversity in science and tech and really moving the needle and, and, and going fast. And um, Charlie Bolden talked about it's critical. Diversity is critical. Um, Brenda talked about also let's take bold steps. So I, I can't think of more bold steps than sort of reversing even this conversation as well as partnering with groups that you wouldn't otherwise partner with. Take that risk. Um, you've partnered with us at Women at the Frontier. There are other great organizations. I Am That Girl is a great organization that really looks at self-esteem of young girls. Um, you know, Summit Series is a great network. These people are the catalyst in communities that get awareness out that's completely viral. So partnering with these groups um, can really uh, take your, your ask and your need and your questions in such a wildfire way to the community and then come back to you in terms of what you need. So I would say that, yeah, but we're here, we're here and we want to help you. You know, we want to also be part of it. Um, so, you know, just, just 
you know, come to us, ask us, and you know, we're, we're ready to go because we are also impatient. We're, we're impatient to also see this change now, um, to, to make it happen. And, and really, um, so appoint us, uh, have us come, but also let's go to the target that, that we're actually asking the questions of. Let's hear from them and let's get their design solutions okay. um, at the table. Sounds like a challenge. Brenda, did you hear that? That's mission STEM too. <laughs> Flip it. All right. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, spoken like a true entrepreneur that you are. I appreciate that. Dennis, you have the anchor and bring us, bring us home. All right. Thank you. I'll try. Uh, see if I can. First, I have to learn how to work this thing. All right. Sure you don't want to? Really? Okay. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Dennis Woodfork. Uh, as Donald said, I'm from Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I am a success story with diversity. Um, I'm a dad who's got four kids and I'm trying to make sure that they understand the importance of STEM. So I wanted to talk to you today for a couple of minutes about um, first, why it's important to increase diversity. I think some of us know this, but just to put it in the context of my background as a technologist, then I'll talk a couple of minutes about uh, solutions and then the implications for the future. So the first thing I did when um, I was asked to do this panel is I went uh, and just started looking for information about what people had said about increasing uh, workforce diversity with regards to STEM. And I come, came across two interesting studies, one by uh, Forbes and one by the National Center for uh, Women and Information Technology. And some of the key takeaways, I'm not gonna brief this slide obviously, but um, it, it's one of those things that it starts with the top and diversity uh, and inclusion is not a side project that a CEO gives to someone to get them out of their hair. It has to be a part of their innovation strategy, their business strategy. That means they have to put resources towards it. That means that they need to make sure that there's metrics and they're tracking it. And that means that it needs to be something that gets talked about a lot. Um, and I think it's important to just underscore that point that um, leadership has to be intentional in how they're thinking about diversity and tell the company and show the company that this is a part of our strategy for being successful. Um, another key piece that uh, I thought was interesting in one of these studies was that having a diverse workforce in and of itself can help to recruit others that are diverse to come to work for you, right? So if you see a company and they look like a diverse uh, part of society and you want to be a part of that, that serves in and of itself as a recruiting tool. So you have to live it, not just say that we're diverse, but show it in how you are in that culture. That helps to bring people along. Hey, come work for us. We're a team that values your opinion no matter where you come from. The other thing I'll, I'll say is that the, the STEM workforce, and, and so as a, someone that's a veteran, I want us to all remember that Veterans are also part of this diverse culture that we're talking about. People that served in the military, and, and surprisingly, some people don't know that you know, the Department of Defense values STEM as well to keep us ahead and keep our country safe. So you'll have a lot of veterans that are, go in as officers or enlisted. I'm one of them. I went to the Naval Academy and got a BS in aerospace engineering. But you're trained in STEM because it helps you to do your job and helps to keep this country safe. So when you're a company or an institution that's looking for diverse people to bring in, also think about that other axis of veterans and how they can come in and help you become more diverse in how they think about things, as well as the, the technical acumen that they may bring. All right, next slide, sorry. So one of the things that I also saw, and I was thinking about uh, different companies and how, you remember a few years ago, there was, uh, I guess, some controversy on some of our tech companies uh, Susan can probably talk better to this than I can, but tech companies that were having challenges with diversity and the administration actually partnered with these companies. I'm, I'm not sure if you can see that. I guess you can. It's a apologize for that. But if you could read it, what it would say is that a bunch of companies at the very bottom there have taken a pledge and that letter is addressed to the president of the United States and it says, we as Silicon Valley tech companies are pledging our commitment to making our workforces more diverse. And what that means is that we're gonna track metrics, we're gonna do more outreach, we're gonna do what we can to make sure that our companies are more reflective of society. Now, I think that's a good first step, but I will tell you, and this is where I get into what I think we should be doing, I will tell you that it's not enough. 
I think one of the issues that we have as Americans is we are not cultivating our STEM workforce early enough. It's not, it's not enough to go to a, a college recruiting fair or to go visit even high schools. I think you need to start even earlier than that. So imagine, if you will, if we had something analogous to the YMCA, but for STEM, all across the country. The YMCA is in about 10,000 or some odd neighborhoods across the country. It started in the 1850s or something like that here in this country. And their charter was to give young men a place and a refuge and to teach them um, about society, reading, fitness, and things like that. Why can't we do the same thing with STEM? Put these in neighborhoods from inner cities to rural America. And I think the way that you could do this is you partner with your Fortune 500 companies. Have them fund it, give them a tax incentive, a write-off, or, or what have you. But have these institutions be something that's open and free for everyone to come. And you want to really target people, kids, like my own children are 10 and 11. Kids at that age are already doing tech at a rate that we could never even imagine 30 years ago, right? So they have this acumen already. And imagine, if you will, a company, after a person goes through this program at age eight, learns to code, and then they walk into a company and say, I've been coding for 15 or 20 years already. Please hire me, right? That's a powerful statement. We as Americans need to start growing our STEM workforce at that age. And the reason is, because if you look at this, I got this from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, and it was a projection of how many STEM, I just pulled the data for STEM-related fields, and then the one at the bottom I'll talk about. Um, what our government is projecting the, the workforce to be in uh, 2022, so 10 years from when the study was. And you can see there, computers and math, 18%, and there's the median salary in, in 2012. Uh, obviously, you project it into vineyard dollars, and it'll go higher for 2022. But I, I think when you look at this and you say, companies are hiring and are hungry for, for STEM professionals. And if we're not growing them in this country, they're gonna go overseas and get them, right? But I think we have what it takes and we have the children and the imagination, the creativity, and that's where we're gonna get the diversity in our workforce. It's growing those kids, not looking serendipitously at a junior in college and saying, oh, you popped up as a STEM you know, potential um, employee, so we're gonna hire you. No, why are we not intentionally growing that person from age six and having them develop those skills early enough and then giving them big brothers or big sisters or what have you so that as they keep going, they're actually enabled and ready to work in our workforce and address these, these jobs here. Um, so I know probably over five minutes and I wanna get into the conversation, so I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Ness, I appreciate it. Um, great uh, opening salvos, that's really wonderful. Um, I wanted to um, dig a little deeper into a couple of themes that we've talked about. Um, one of them is, and I'll, maybe I'll start with this, this very notion of STEM. You know, STEM is, you've kind of turned it into a thing. People even wonder, can you get a degree in STEM? And it's kind of silly because it represents four, you know, science alone has, I don't know how many disciplines and, and mathematics has how many variations and so, um, in some respects, I think we've kind of overdone this notion that it's like this thing that if you're, you're cool if you're STEM and then you're not if you're not, kind of like the star belly speeches and Dr. Seuss. And I've actually met, you know, NASA people who, you know, bypassed a NASA booth at a career fair because they thought, well, I'm not STEM, so I don't want to talk to the NASA person. Turns out the person was studying finance and they said, we well, you know we hire more non-STEM people than we do STEM people. And he's now fortunately a, a, a NASA employee, so we almost missed that person. So I'd like to, in the context of, you know, the future workforce, and, you know, we know that there's probably going to be jobs and professions and disciplines that are going to emerge. I mean, when I was a teenager, there was no driverless cars, and there's a lot of things that don't exist, didn't exist then that exist now, and so we can assume extrapolating to the future. So I'm, I'm really interested in probing a little bit more in terms of, you know, we, we've got a, you know, we're on a mission to put humans on Mars and then settle the universe and get people out of low Earth orbit and all of that. And I really do believe that that's what our destiny is as a human species. So in order to do that, which is, you know, we'll make Apollo look like a jog around the park, I mean, what, how do we support people today along the pipeline, if you will, 
to be prepared when we don't even know, like, you know, I mean, cyber anything wasn't even a term 30 years ago, as far as I know. So how do, I mean, Dr. Ward, you want to start with your thoughts on that? I think some of the important points that have come uh, from uh, the discussion thus far is that there are not specific fields per se or disciplines that we should over-represent or overly draw from. Um, it, it is the case that I have a colleague who used to say, having been trained in the social and behavioral sciences, and there was always the dichotomy of the hard sciences and the soft sciences. And my colleague used to say, they're the hard sciences and the difficult sciences, right? <laughs> all of the sciences matter, and it takes all of the scientific background. But what many uh, are looking for in attracting the talent of the future, as you pointed out, Donald, the nature of work is changing so fundamental, fundamentally. We don't, need, we don't know necessarily what to project for. But one thing for sure is that we do know people are looking for very passionate, uh, diverse young prof uh, professionals who, by their own life experience, bring intellectual diversity of thought to whatever the problem uh, happens to be. Uh, capabilities like being able to work in STEM. I'm singing to the choir here. Uh, teamwork, the ability to communicate, uh, and the ability to go deep in some areas, but to be broad enough to be agile and flexible to wherever the opportunity lends itself. So, the interdisciplinary thinking absolutely. and training is, is equally as important as being focused in one area, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, you talked about collaboration, and that was what really what made your heart sing in terms of the work that you were doing. I mean, how would you tell a young uh, potential engineer who someone comes to you and says, "Hey, I want to be just like you, Joe, and I'm going to be a NASA engineer." You know, how do you coach them about what's going on for the next? I think everything has to be tailored to the individual at some point, but some things you can back up a little bit. So the challenges that I may face in my job will not most likely be the challenges that they will face coming into the new workforce. So rather than address my challenge to them, maybe we start to talk about a little bit, step back a little bit and say, how do you, how do you move past the challenge? How do you address the challenge? And I think there are some basic human traits that can be honed and, and, and developed at younger ages to make them adaptable and flexible, as you said, to, to newer opportunities. Um, humility. I mean, not everybody gets a trophy in life. So, and, and sometimes you can crash a spacecraft. You know, hopefully we won't crash a spacecraft. Please, just, please don't crash a spacecraft. <laughs> but, um, but, but understanding your your piece and understanding your contribution and understanding that you may make mistakes and knowing where you can go to get help um, is is a key. I think it's an individual trait that people need to develop in order to be flexible and adaptable. Things like that, I think they can work on their team working skills or their ability to work in teams and collaborate is something that early on that that should be developed. I mean, and, and you do. There are a lot of, um, there. I think there's a little more collaboration in even the grade schools and high schools working in labs together. I think that's an, I, I, that's something I didn't focus on because, I, you know, I just want to work the numbers, you know, going through school. But that's something you, you probably should emphasize a little bit more. And I think the schools are, are going that way. So uh, f to become flexible and adaptable, I think there are some characteristics of human, some human qualities that you can emphasize as, as kids get older. So perhaps even encouraging them to deliberately seek out people to work with in teams that are not from their particular background or cultures, which could be uncomfortable for some people, right, if you've grown up in certain areas to, to make a point of doing that. Um, I mean, you've had to adapt because of your background and history. Yeah. I mean, how was that for you? And well, I grew up in Honduras, Central America. My parents were in the Peace Corps. So uh, growing up there, I always looked around and thought, where are the women? Like, I mean, there were women. My mom, my grandmother, incredible, my sister, my aunt, incredible, incredible women, and my father, very supportive. But um, you know, we know as kids and, and, and middle school and high school, which is, we're talking about a young pipeline, but we know what it looks like to end up being a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer. Um, we still don't have an awareness of what it's like if you go in and do science and tech for these kids, and even in college, you're still like, but what do I do with that? Like, what, what does my day-to-day -day look like? What, what does my life 
look like? What, what do I accomplish? And so, you know, um, Joe Handelsman yesterday talked about identity, identifying yourself as a scientist. And like, am I a scientist? I mean, my background is anthropology and law. But I've ended up now in fields um, as a bridge and a catalyst to expand the community of science and technology for women and minorities. So it's, this, it's broadening the definition uh, that we're all in it together. Um, you know, it's, it's just a, you know, if, you're, if anybody here is a gamer, um, you know, playing a game or doing a, um, being in part of, part of the gaming industry, you know, they do epic battles, but you don't know who your other players are. You don't know what their uh, background is. Most of the time, you don't know what degrees they have, but you know what the problem is that you're trying to solve. And it's this collective community all coming together, some experts, um, some new, uh, to be um, collaborative, uh, supportive, and to try and solve this problem. And I think in science and tech, trying to get more minorities, women and girls in it, it could be like that, like this epic conversation of what is a big challenge that NASA has? Because NASA's created a lot of inventions and innovation that a lot of you guys know what that's done for the world and, and on a daily basis for us. But outside of the space industry, most people don't know how it's benefited their lives. So allowing us to be, again, co-creators, co-collaborators um, with you on whatever it is that you're trying to solve uh, could be a really powerful tool not of engagement, awareness, energy, this excitement that you're talking about, passion. And that's also the workforce, because then you, then you see um, who could be future collaborators? And you know, President Obama at the White House uh, State of Women Summit also said, you know, you can't you can't be what you can't see. And so, being able to see what you're doing, being able to see leaders that are diverse, being able to understand what that means for you, what 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 will you look like? What will you be doing? Um, being active participants and having immersive experiences, um, I think that that is what could create a change, a shift. So let's say, let me ask this about this notion of, we talked about broadening participation and, and we're certainly interested in that. And if we go back to this notion of this STEM container and you know, many of us are, are now talking about, well, it's important to introduce the A, arts or architecture or D for design in it. I was in Israel recently, they actually have I STEAM, they put I before it, and I stands for innovation mm -hmm. and innovators, also a play on Israel as well, they told me. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, do we put the whole alphabet in, or I mean, what, what, where, <laughs> where are we going with this? What do you think? Dennis, what no, do you I, think? I think it's important that, um, and I try to do this with my, my own children, is even though I'm a geek and I love numbers and I like making equations balance and optimizing trajectories, I actually like doing that. Um, it's important that um, kids understand that the arts and music and things like that can influence and make you a more uh, diverse and rich engineer or scientist, right? So as, a, as an engineer, my job is to sometimes design things and I have to engage parts of my brain that aren't the equation balancing side to make elegant designs, right? A, an example in industry would be like Apple, right? So Apple loves to not just make technology work, they like to make it elegant and they like to make it aesthetically pleasing, and right? And that's helped their bottom line tremendously. There's this great story about uh, Steve Jobs' inspiration for one of the fonts that Apple created was he decided to take a calligraphy class at Stanford, something totally outside of what he was studying, and he, he, that's where he got his inspiration. So, right. And there's a couple of TED Talks. A, a gentleman named Brand Farron talks about um, going overseas and seeing art in Europe, and, yeah. and he's a technologist, and that inspired him greatly on how he thinks about engineering and, and science and design. So yeah. I think you definitely, you should never de-emphasize music or those things. Um, it should be a balanced portfolio, if you will. But as today, you know, looking at the statistics that you've shown, that, you know, they want a job and they want to make money. And it's like, how do I make money being a poet? Or, I mean, how do you answer that? Because this is what people are looking at. And yet I'm concerned that it might be a false choice that's being made. And, I don't know, Jill, you have any? I, I don't know that anybody joins NASA for the money. I just don't see that happening. I think there's a bigger picture. No, <laughs> no. It, but there is, there is yeah. something bigger. There's yeah. always a, something bigger that you're working to do. Yeah. There's always more intent. There's always more 
some, they're always more important things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you want to survive, sure, but there's always something else that's pulling you to do something else. And I think you're seeing the trend, the community out there. It's, it's not necessarily about money. Yes, there is livelihood and you need to take care of your family, but a lot of people, what they're going for is that passion, that interest, that um, they want to help be part of problem solvers for the world, to do good things for the world, and um, to work, to show transparency at work, um, to have uh, honesty at work, to uh, feel like they're being heard, like their voices count, like they're at the table. Um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Bowman, I think it was yesterday, talked about that STEM careers are hard, but also she looked at it as uh, if, we, if we compare it to athletes, you need to train, you need mentors, you need resources, you need support. Um, and that's how she related the science and tech field, and I thought it was such a good uh, analogy. And it's true for, for the work outside right now. It, it's this collaborative conversation where you know, people now, the workforce of the future, the pipeline of the future, women, minorities, um, you know, uh, individuals that are retired, they want to be part of the conversation. Kids want to be part of the conversation, and it's not necessarily uh, the money. It's why would they want to join this team? What are they going to be doing? Does it matter? Um, and I think that's where engaging them to show them why it matters. Why does this invention or this idea impact you on a daily basis? The 3D printer, when you know, is a great, great example. Um, there are people, it's still, um, there's still people trying to understand, but what does it do for me? You know, if you're in Peru or if you're in Paraguay or if you're in, in India or anywhere around the world, what does it do for them having a 3D printer? It's not the 3D printer itself, it's the fact that now you can manufacture and create anything that you want. And if everybody in their house had a 3D printer and they can now start printing uh, spoons, tables, a rocket, um, a heart, um, you know, talk about issues that have to do with transplants. If you can now 3D print your own heart and you don't have to worry about somebody dying for you to wait to get the transplant. If you can 3D print your own home if there's a disaster relief. But what does that do for the manufacturing company? What does that do for industry? So I think it's now about engaging the community for their voice and their opinion. I mean, I, I, in my previous life as a lawyer, but it's also about policy. How can we, how do we talk about security, identity, privacy in an area where anybody can build a drone and fly it over your home and listen in on what you're doing. So we need more, you know, again, um, Dr. Ellen still talking about let's not leave talent at the table. Let's not leave anybody out because we don't know where these incredible creative ideas are going to come from. And that's part of what we're talking about now is we can't have the whole alphabet in, in this um, abbreviation, but it is important to get the voices of musicians and artists and scientists and lawyers and um, you know uh, outside individuals because they're all part of the community of the world and and talk about well if we go to Mars when we go to Mars who owns Mars who will colonize Mars what will that structure look like um, airways you know water um, who gets a right to be at the table to make those decisions so I think that's what's important to it's important too because I when NASA achieves something, we inspire artists yeah. to create yeah. movies or music, right? And that might inspire people at NASA to do other things, right? So it's this, it's this ecosystem yeah. like you were talking about. And we're, as a NASA employee, I'm fully aware that I'm part of this ecosystem that has to be, do its part in, in order to make sure that everyone has a chance to, to express themselves, whether or not it's you know, science and engineering or, or yeah. art. Yeah. Your second question, kind of, it's the same thing that um, you know, NASA has been, you know, self entitled to the best, happiest place to work in the federal government. Yeah. So why is that? It's it's the people, yes, absolutely. People are the, you know, that's what makes NASA. But it's the mission. I mean, we're going to put boots on Mars. Mm -hmm. That's just cool. I mean, you have so many people that have such passion to getting that mission, and it it, it takes all of STEM or STEAM or iSTEM or whatever you want to call it. But it's the mission and the common vision of the agency that makes us great, and the people who put that vision together. You get to participate and engage, and it's you know it's it, it really is yeah. yeah it is it's cool. If you, those of you don't work for NASA, you're missing out. <laughs> Let us work with NASA. Yeah. We want to work. Yeah. With you. Wanda, you had something. Yes. 
a couple of observations and to follow up uh, of why NASA is so powerful in terms of rankings, the FEVs uh, results, et cetera, but to the point that you were just making about the empowerment and the engagement, the mission is extremely critical, but having everyone have a voice in achieving that mission at every level becomes really important. And so when you began to talk about attracting and developing talent that has heretofore systematically been excluded from these environments, you have to rethink the environment in which, into which you're trying to bring yes. them as well. One of the uh, points that Jill made was being willing to make mistakes. I think that's an extremely important point because there is evidence that mistakes are costlier for certain groups of people, that is the underrepresented, who we're calling the diverse individuals. And there's, there's mounds of data that say, you know, you might make a mistake once, and if you get shut down, you're not coming back. I mean, you're, just, you're not going to re-engage. And that's even at the level of scientists and engineers. We have data, for example, at NSF, the younger uh, talent, the early career, um, depending upon the type of engagement they have, they won't resubmit as frequently uh, as, uh, as, as colleagues from the majority uh, environment. So this issue of mentorship and sponsorship, and there's a big difference, right? Yeah. And the sponsorship that's uh, distributed in, in, in a more equal uh, fashion for, for members from diverse communities become very important. But those structures, those institutional climates and structures into which we're trying to attract these millions of new and creative learners, we have to take a hard look at how we do business as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, add add to what she's, so I, I think it's very important, as she was saying, when the first time as an engineer, as an engineering student, when you get that C, or right, if you were a straight A student all the way through school, high school, and then you get into your engineering class and the, the mean is a 70, right? And, and so you, you quickly get jarred into this, what world am I now going into? And it's very important that for minorities um, and uh, underrepresented groups to have someone like they did for me to pick me up and say, yes, you failed, but that's not the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. You need to pick yourself up, learn from that, and keep going. And it's that, that whole value of tenacity that I think when you talk about what can you do to train the next generation for problems that we don't even know about, it's that, that value of being able to work through adversity no matter what it is and having those sponsors to say, yes, yes, it's hard, right? We know calculus and all of those things are hard, but you can do it. You just have to keep trying and you have to raise the bar, right? You, whatever you're doing wasn't good enough. You have to go at it again, but not just say, well, you guys, you're not good enough and you need to go find another career field. Right, and again, right. role models, Edison, right, he said, I didn't fail, I found 10,000 ways it didn't work. Yeah. And, um, and that's science, right? And that's, and that's NASA and all these groups that are here that they're saying, yes, it's take, you know, we've, we've talked about how to get more women and minorities in science and tech for a while now. We're trying to go faster. What's the step change? But Failure or learning is part of the process, and as startups and entrepreneurship, we fail fast, we fail often, but we, you know we, we just keep going, and it's okay. It's part of the DNA of being an entrepreneur, and it, it has been part of being a scientist as well, right? You know the scientific method of trying, and it's true here with what you're, you guys are trying to accomplish, which is how to create a pipeline quickly and move the needle fast and um, exponentially accelerate the numbers and, and change the ratio. And it's not about what the answer is. It's, it's about if we get these different solutions and, and voices at the table, then there's at least representation. Then we decide what is the ultimate thing we want to do and how are we going to go there. But as long as that voice has been added, that's, that's what's most important, that that community has been heard and has been part of it. Um, so. Well, great. Well, we're, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to uh, change gears a little bit, but first, uh, let's acknowledge our panel members for their <laughs> And um, 
Don't go anywhere because after Keith talks, we'll have an opportunity for uh, questions and answers. So the audience, this is your time to begin thinking about your questions. So it's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague from our human capital office, uh, Keith Lowe, who's going to tell you the real deal. How do you get into NASA since you now know that we're a great place to work? That's right. That's right. So yeah, he's, he's got his wallet out. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Donald. This is, this is kind of a very hard act to follow and to actually even, even come out of because they're coming from an inspirational space and I have a program to talk about. It's a human resources program. This is how our process works. But we're very proud of our Pathways programs. Um, they're leaders in government and they give us an opportunity to do recruiting and outreach and have a lot of the dialogue of the kind that we've talked about with the panel. Uh, the Pathways programs at NASA is uh, the Pathways is a government-wide program, and uh, so we have federal-wide rules and processes that we follow, but we have a particular implementation of it at NASA. It was established in 2012, and I just want to be, uh, give you a little bit of an insight into the components of the program and how each of them work, and uh, I'll be really interested in any questions that you have about how our program works in relation to you and your students and how they might be able to interface with us. But the three components of the Pathways program are the Pathways Intern Program, the Recent Graduate Program, and the Presidential Management Fellows. Okay. The first is the Pathways Intern Program, and this is uh, analogous to uh, a co-op program, I think is probably the more common usage at most companies. Uh, that used to actually be the terminology in the federal government. Uh, we've gone through a few iterations since then. It was then the, the student, career ex student Career Experience Program, and now it's the Pathways Intern Program. And, and there have been some changes along the way that make it different from a, a traditional co-op program. But the ways in which it are similar are include, it's a program for current students and for individuals who have been accepted into accredited uh, educational institutions. The um, Pathways interns are enrolled in a variety of educational institutions and they have paid opportunities to work at NASA and explore federal careers while they're in school. The program exposes students to jobs in the federal career service by providing meaningful development work at the beginning of their career before their career paths are established. They get to meet and work with uh, NASA engineers and scientists, and they get to have the kind of experiences that help them make decisions in their education. So what kind of classes am I going to take? When I look at the kind of jobs that I see around me, what kind of decisions do I want to make about my own development? It can be empowering for them in that way, and it also gives them access to, to engineers and scientists who can help guide them al along their way. So it's, it's really a great program. It's very popular at NASA. Uh, we have one of the, the largest intern programs in the federal government, and it's a key component of our Pathways program. Um, at the end of the program participation, basically they work, and then they graduate. Uh, they can be converted to what we call career conditional appointments, which is basically a beginning appointment in the civil service. Um, uh, they have a set of qualification requirements, which I have up there uh, for aerospace technology that's standard to anyone. Uh, they have a 2.9 GPA, and they are U.S. citizens. So that's the kind of just overview of the, the Pathways interns. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the differences between Pathways and what the co-op program used to be, just because I know that some of you will have had experiences working with NASA or with other federal agencies uh, in a co-op setting. Um, the key difference for Pathways is that now whenever we have uh, one of these intern vacancies, we have to advertise it um, to all citizens. So basically all of our positions are advertised on OPM's website, which is usajobs.gov, and all citizens are given a chance to apply for the positions. We use competitive processes in order to make sure that everyone has an equitable chance and we make sure that veterans' preference is applied. We've actually seen an increase in our percentage of veterans since Pathways was, was implemented. We're up to approximately 25% veterans uh, from a lower number we had under co-op. Um, because we have the public notice process, the 
competition for positions has become more intense. Uh, we have about 100 applications for every intern position that we fill. Another change that the public notice process has caused for us, and it, it is that HR speak, I hate even saying it, but that's, that's the process that we're in. So because we advertise to the public and everyone gets a fair chance to apply, we've had to change how we interface with students and with universities. So in the past, we were able to say, go to a job fair, meet some great students, hire them directly as interns. Or maybe we would have a collaborative working relationship with an institution of higher learning and we would get hooked up with some students. We say, yes, you'd be great for interns, come, come be at NASA. Um, we don't have that kind of direct tie um, anymore in terms of bringing people in. We have a little more of an indirect connection. So our emphasis now is more in terms of outreach. And we need to think about how we communicate with educational institutions, how we communicate with potential candidates, with students, and um, that, that is kind of a very different dynamic. I, I love listening to the panel um, talking about the kinds of messages that will resonate with students because now that we're more in the outreach business, these are the kind of things that we really need to take to heart and incorporate into what we do. Um, in terms of the, a little more on the, the changed relationships with universities, um, in the co-op program, there was a requirement that we had a formal agreement with a particular university. And so only some universities were allowed to place interns in the government, ones that had the formal agreements. The change with Pathways is that now students from any educational institution can be interns at NASA. Um, there's also been some shifts in terms of, I said, the directness of the connection with universities, but we're still vitally interested in staying connected with you and making sure that the word about our program uh, goes out and that we can be responsive to any questions that you have. Um, another, another shift kind of on the same theme, uh, we used to, I know that Carolyn Knowles presented yesterday on the NASA Intern Fellowships and Scholarships Program. We used to have kind of a clear pipeline from that program into the intern program. Even when people participate in the NIFS programs, they still have to go through the competitive process for the Pathways Intern Program. So again, it's, it's indirect. There's, there are connections between all these things, but it's just, it's less of like a direct feeder and more of a community of, of candidates that would be great that we consider. Okay. Um, just to give you a sense of the, the demographics and the overview of our program, uh, we hire about 150 to 200 interns per year at NASA centers all across the country. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, NASA overall hires between 600 and 800 people a year. So as a percentage, you can see that that's a, that's a pretty high number uh, each year that we hire as interns. Roughly two-thirds of our interns are science and engineering interns. About 40% are graduate, 60% are undergraduate. We receive about 15,000 to 20,000 applications per year. Once we bring the interns on, we usually end up converting about 60% of them which I believe is still the highest rate of conversions of interns across the federal government. So we're, we're very proud of that. We really see this as a pipeline program that works for NASA. Uh, at the current time, we have about 500 interns. They're enrolled at 200 universities in 46 states in the Uni District of Columbia. So we really are committed to uh, geographic diversity in our program and our hiring. Okay. Uh, next, moving on to the recent graduate program. Now, as I said, Pathways is, the, is, our, is, is our heavy lift uh, entry level pipeline program. Uh, the two other components are the hiring levels are a little lower. So we uh, usually advertise about 20 recent graduate positions across the agency uh, every year. So to give you a sense of scale. But the recent graduate program is designed for individuals who have graduated within the past two years um, from a qualifying educational institution or program. And what this, what this does is, so I'm gonna kind of back out and think of our normal hiring, which we're always giving everyone a chance. That's what we do in the government. We make sure that everyone has a chance to apply. And when we talk about hiring that's outside of these programs, um, sometimes people with a lot more experience um, come out 
ahead of people who are recent graduates. So what's special about the recent graduate program is it sets aside some positions and it says, okay, we're just gonna look at people within two years and so you won't be outcompeted by people who say have been working in the industry for, for 10 years. So it's, it's, it's a very neat feature. But the, the competition still works the same way it does for um, other, other federal jobs, veterans preference applies. Um, once we hire them, they're in a developmental program for one year. After one year of continuous service and successful job completion, then we do the conversion to this, that career conditional appointment, which is their, their first appointment in the civil service. Okay. And finally, we have the Presidential Management Fellows Program. Um, we usually hire on average up to five individuals a year as presidential management fellows at NASA. Um, this is a program that's administered by the Office of Personnel Management. They advertise for a set of vacancies, um, take in a lot of applications, and they do some very rigorous screening of, of these individuals who all have graduate or professional degrees. Um, there's a written examination, there's an in-person behavioral assessment, and they do a down select and they give us a list of candidates that, that we, can, we can choose from for the presidential management fellow positions. Uh, these folks are a little more senior than the other, than the interns, um, because they, they have the, the graduate degrees. Uh, once they come on board, uh, they have kind of an enriched experience for two years. They have 80 hours of training. They have a developmental or rotational assignment. Um, they work with a senior level mentor. Um, one thing that uh, is kind of neat news in the Presidential Management Fellows Program is that a couple years ago, NASA worked with the Office of Personnel Management to develop a special STEM track for the Presidential Management Fellows. And uh, we have actually done some hiring from the STEM track of Presidential Management Fellows. Once they complete their two years, they're eligible for conversion into the civil service. Okay. So that's, that's the overview that I had of, of our programs. Uh, it is definitely a shift from these kind of more inspirational spaces, things, but um, I did want to give you a framework for thinking about what we do and the kind of framework that we're in when we go out and have the kind of conversations like we've been talking about. Um, I'll turn it back to, to Donald to lead us with the questions. Last piece of trivia, I'm actually a product of the Presidential Management Fellows Program. They didn't call it that back then, way long ago, but uh, it was actually 34 years ago uh, this month that I began my career at Goddard, and um, uh, I'm very happy to, I'm as happy today as I was that first day that I stepped foot on Goddard's campus. Um, so we're gonna turn uh, this opportunity over to the audience to ask questions. Uh, there are are there people with microphones, or how are we working this? Oh, yes, there. Raise your hand there. Microphones, and then uh, please identify yourself and to whom you're addressing your question. Question, if you have a speech, keep it short. Thank you. Okay. My name is Tim Berg. I'm from the University of Georgia. And uh, my, my question is, how do we create a realistic vision of what a STEM career is? Right, if I show on all my slides that you're gonna work and go to the moon and you end up working on voltage sag at the power company, it, it seems like maybe I'm not given a, a real picture of, of what a STEM career is. And so I just wondered for the panel, what do you think? How, how can we sell more mundane seeming jobs as exciting? So. What's a real STEM career? <laughs> Jill captured it best when you talk about the end product. It's not just what you're doing at that moment, but if you're a part of a team, if you're part of something larger than yourself, then you have to know and you have to really understand, internalize that what you're doing is enabling something greater than yourself to happen. So even if you're testing the voltage across a motherboard or you know, you're trying to affix a spacecraft into a, a vacuum chamber and your job is to make sure it doesn't tip over, right? You know that part of what you're doing eventually is going to pay dividends for the world because we're gonna discover something great that, we've, that we didn't even know um, we had the possibility to, to discover, right? So it has to be your part, and it's the same thing you do with football. Like, I like to use football's analogy. 
an O lineman or an offensive lineman or a defensive lineman, right? They're in the trenches and they're going like this and they're pushing and, right? But there, if you're an offensive lineman, you're enabling the quarterback to get the ball somewhere so that you can get that touchdown. But the O lineman has to know that without him doing his job, quarterback's going to get sacked and, you're, and the team's not going to win, right? So you have to put it into those terms for kids to understand, I think. Very specifically, I mean, I'm from the University of Georgia. Go dogs. So awesome. Um, you know, there's a lot of pitch competitions out there uh, in, in the entrepreneurship world um, that are looking for great solutions, design solutions to solve problems. There's a lot of um, great partnerships that can be done with organizations that are looking also to solve problems. I mean, just, just in, in, in the ATL or in Georgia, I mean, with Chick-fil-A and Coca-Cola and GE, and there's uh, some great partners, private sector partners that have got Panasonic, um, that are always looking for creative ways to solve their internal company problems. And if you're at a university and you're a faculty, something really great would be uh, have a partnership with, with a company that has an actual problem or just design one in class and say, let's solve this problem. And then go out and pitch your idea, whether it's a pitch competition or not. Um, but that collaborative work on an actual issue that relates to science and technology and design and some coding um, and some software development is what will just engage the energy and the passion of what that looks like which could turn into a startup. It, their research, I mean, there's great students that are doing incredible research right now in the labs, turning that into an actual project or how can that be flipped into a startup model or a pitch or something to NASA. But having an active, being an active participant uh, with group environment, um, solving an actual problem is, is the energy that will get them to say, okay, this is what science is about. I get, this is what creating technologies and this is what, how it will positively impact the lives of the people in my community in Athens. Um, Singularity University has a competition with the University of Georgia where every year uh, your students are allowed to design a solution to impact a million people in the state of Georgia and the winner gets a full scholarship to Singularity. So that's something that you guys also can work together or First Robotics also has a great competition where students can, can join in and collaborate and and just design solutions that solve problems. So within your own classroom, you could create that as the metrics for uh, the end of the year term um, and have teams assembled in competition to solve a problem. I mean, there's, there's water, there's pollution, there's access to clean water, there's, there's so many, and, and, and some that could relate to NASA's mission. Um, and by just having that proof of concept within your class, then you could present that to NASA and say, now give us a grant to expand, but I think that Ex, um, immersive experience into what it is to build something is what will be the example um, and the role model of what science and tech is. Otherwise, it's, there's a disconnect there. Let's go to some other questions. I think I saw some hands up there. Yes, over on the right. Hi, my name is uh, Jack Mustard at Brown University. Um, you spoke earlier at the beginning about the demographics of NASA's workforce and presenting it as a problem. But then I was wondering, Keith, do you have demographics of this interesting pathways program, it seems kind of a small pipeline to fill NASA's needs, even though there's, there's a direct path to NASA there. But you didn't mention what the demographics of that was and whether it was attentive to these future needs. The Can demographics of the pathways? Demographics of the pathways program. You said I got 100 you know, people a year, and they have yeah. a direct pathway, which yeah. hopefully will fill your demographic challenge. Right. But is it, and are there plans to, to further that, that effort? Unfortunately, I didn't come with a slide uh, on demographics, uh, but I can say in a, it just in a, in a general sense that the students coming through the intern program are more diverse than the current workforce that we have. I, I really, I just don't even have the numbers uh, with me, but, but they are, they're, they're part of uh, the hiring that we do. Uh, Pathways is I think probably the, the third largest hiring mechanism. As I said, we do 600, 800 hires a year. Um, so although this is an important component, um, we're actually bringing in diverse candidates through a variety of different hiring mechanisms. A lot of it has to do with where we go to um, outreach and make it known and available. I mean, the days when you know you can call your friend who was at Brown and who happened to have a contract and they put you in touch with the systems engineers, yeah, come on in, and you know, kind of replicating it because of your association 
I mean, that's what the purpose of having the structure the way it is now is to sort of level that playing field. And then it comes down to, you know, just the merit selection through the uh, competition process. But I think, I mean, we don't, I don't have the data. We can probably provide it. I'm, I'm almost confident that, you know, the, the incoming uh, pathway interns, you know, clearly look more like the distribution around the country's relevant civil, civil labor force than it did maybe years ago. Yeah, they're, uh, they're more diverse in, in all categories. Yeah. Question in the back. Thank you very much. Good morning. Buenos dias. Um, I'm Yvette Hewitt at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And I wanted to ask um, the panel, I guess, that advance, NSF has the advanced program to help change academia. Um, and there are things that have come out of advance that help change the climate so that it is more, you know, we know that academia was set up for white men who had wives at home that could do the things that we have for, to get to tenure, et cetera, and we have to change the, the workplace. What is the federal government doing beyond, you know, we have NSF doing advance at institutions. What are you doing to change NASA so that NASA can be more welcoming and have those kinds of individuals move up, not just arrive here, but move up into higher positions so that they change the institution so that it is a different place in the future? That's a great question. Um, you wanted, you, wanna, you mentioned about NSF, I think, right at the beginning. I wanted to touch on that initially about advance. Is that something that you mentioned? I, I didn't yeah. quite catch that. <clears throat> Briefly, uh, but I think the, the heart of her question was there are some efforts underway uh, to diversify and promote institutional right. transformation in academe. What's the counterpart in the federal government oh, okay. at large and, and NASA in particular? Um, very briefly, ADVANCE was a program that was instituted in 2001. Uh, I actually had the privilege to be one of the ones to conceptualize and help develop it initially. And the goal of that was institutional transformation. Um, it, 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 they had the saying not to fix the people, but to fix the places into which you were bringing, similar to some of the uh, suggestions earlier. And over that decade and, and a half, some very impressive gains have been made. And it, this, this program was developed on the basis of known research and, uh, and evidence. And uh, uh, the, uh, the objective is to get more women, in particular, into the upper, upper echelons of academe. Uh, most people know the data. There, there's, a higher level of representation of women and, and ethnic uh, minorities at the lower levels, assistant professor, say, for example. Even in the life sciences, by the time you get to the full professor level, even in the life sciences, that just drops precipitously. And so in, uh, changing policies, uh, changing hiring mechanisms, more uh, career life balance kinds of act, uh, activities, and taking ownership at the highest levels, the president, the provost uh, being uh, the leader. And marked improvements have been shown in the institutions that have been funded for five to 10 years, not only in the numbers who reach higher levels of academe and even go into higher administration, you know, deans, provosts, presidents, et cetera. But again, the climate has been affected, uh, not perfect, but, but demonstrable um, evaluated uh, progress has been made, not only in the institutions that NSF has funded for advance, but some other non-funded uh, advance programs have adapted uh, the basic structure and um, are seeing progress as well. But, but I'm also very interested in her uh, expanding that to the federal government. Yeah, I, I know that, um, and I see our chief scientists over there. My recollection is, Ellen, you, you looked at this issue of women even in NASA because there's data that talks about that we're doing better at bringing them in, but they tend to drop out earlier or, um, I don't know, put you on the spot there, but um, the question specifically about what are we doing as an agency to address, is there a microphone for Ellen? Thank, thank you. Yeah, what we've been doing, and I think the first step is to really examining your own inclusive, you know, how inclusive in, is your own environment is to really look at the numbers. And so that's something that Robert Lightfoot and Lisa Rowe who will be talking shortly, what we really did at first, you know, where are the women, where are they sitting, are they dwelling at certain levels before getting promoted or not? 
Are we losing women more rapidly in the technical workforce or not? So the first step is to really look at your workforce. And then we've instituted programs across all the centers. For example, one of the things we've done is revitalize women's focus groups at most of our NASA centers, including here at NASA headquarters, to really look at is there a support network for women really focusing on issues like how do you get into the senior executive service? How can we help each other with promotions, with advancement, with knowing that whole issue of mentorship and sponsorship is so critical. And so how can we create networks within our own NASA centers to help women move forward? So we have a variety of different activities at all the NASA centers. Lisa has us meet regularly, we talk about it. So we're really focusing on that climate issue. What kind of climate are, are we creating and how can we uh, work together um, and it's always big emphasis. We're not just changing women to fit in. We're trying to change the whole culture so that we're more accepting of diversity across the board. Yeah, and I would just say that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Manuel, thank you, yes. If I could just add something here. Um, I think uh, Wanda and Dennis talked about the structure that you have to have in place. You have to be strategic about what you're doing. And at NASA, we do indeed have structures in place. Um, we are constantly looking at our numbers, but we also have a very intentional way of looking at equal employment opportunity. Uh, we have a plan that is a uh, opportunity for the centers to look at their individual issues and address them in the way that they see fit, but we set broad goals and objectives at the agency level. By the same token, we do uh, a similar approach with diversity and inclusion. We have a agency plan uh, which filters down to the centers, and the centers also have to have goals and objectives that are in line with the goals and objectives of the agency. We also have a diversity and inclusion strategic partnership, which is made up of all of the officials in charge at NASA. And we come together regularly. We look at our numbers. We look at what practices and policies we have in place. What do we need to change? So we are strategically addressing these issues in all kinds of ways. It is indeed a part of our strategic structure. And I'd also would say that uh, this agency is very, very good about um, uh, supporting uh, alternative work arrangements and telework and things of that nature. And at the end of the day, it's, I, I think it's, as I see it, it's about being sensitive to uh, the dynamics of our employees and, and what's going to support them, enable them to do the work. Because it's not about, you know, how many hours your belly button is in an office that matters, it's really about the results and the impact of your work. And in this day and age of electronics, I mean, I've, I've worked everywhere. <laughs> so the concept of office is um, wherever I am, that's where my office is. <laughs> so it's true for all of the people, and how do you support that in order to, to, to make it better? So, Can I add one thing? Yeah. Um, because it was... Uh, key to my heart, we talked about you know, moms and um, NASA's, you know, done such a great job at going to the frontier and beyond and, uh, and being a leadership role in this and uh, it's not in other agencies and universities as well, you know, what is a practical step? I'm still surprised that we don't have daycare centers in organizations and institutions when you're a parent. Um, it would really facilitate the conversation of your employees um, having access to daycare um, when you're when you have children um, having access to uh, technology laptops you know, really state-of-the-art tech that can be given to parents so that if they do need to work from home or if somebody needs to uh, create collaborative space um, they can do that um, and so just some some practical things in terms of the access to the target that you're trying to retain in science and technology um, you know, individuals that are retired or veterans, what are the kinds of services that they need to be engaged 
and effective participants in the conversation. And the great thing is we know what those things are. We know what the structures of work need to look like and what the models need to look like um, to be able to allow these individuals to join the conversation. So for those of you that are the gatekeepers of funding and, and, and the leadership that could truly transform the, the, the environment, this environment, um, to make it more accessible and more friendly um, and to still be acknowledged and validated as an employee, even if you're working remotely or if you're working in collaborative teams. Um, I think that's critical also to just retention of these minorities and women because it allows them to see longevity in their career, that they'll still be promoted, that their ideas are still heard, that they're still part of a team and they can get results done. And, and for dads too, who wanna, um, who, have, who are also a primary caretaker, um, it, to me, I think we, we know, you guys are all the scientists and have done so much research and great data. Um, and now it's sort of like, we know what the answer is. So now we just need that leadership and willpower and, and money to just transform the building. Because um, as you said, the building is, is the future of work is not gonna be a building. It, it is gonna be that sort of very um, hybrid, um, flexible type of wherever you are is your work. Um, so how can we create the building to reflect um, and normalize the population? Let me check, uh, do we have any online questions? No, okay, any more questions from the audience? Yes, uh, in the back of the right, yeah. I, that looks like Dr. Coleman, yes. Hi there, um, I'm Katie Colvin, I'm one of the astronauts here at NASA. And here, in listening to things over the last couple days, I've, I've been thinking that basically the same thing that brings people to work here we agreed it's not the money, but actually a paying job is a great thing. Um, but it's, it's the mission, it's the passion, because the mission is so important. And when, when people look at me in the hallway and they know that they play a part in what goes to the launch pad and whether it's safe or as safe as it can be for me, or when you are a part of a project that's gonna land on a planet, you know, you know that everything has to be right. So that, ver that same imperative that brings us here I think makes it difficult for people to not, uh, it makes it difficult for them to pick people that don't look like them because they feel the need to pick the person that they feel would do the very best. Mm -hmm. And if our teams were diverse, we wouldn't have this problem. But in the meantime, we still have the problem of how do we get people to realize that picking someone that doesn't look like them really is picking the best person. And I like your ideas on that. Yeah, I would just add that um, it's not just looks, it's, it's experience. Um, I mean, I've been in a room of, you know, 20 black people and we were probably more diverse than what's in this room. Why? Because, you know, I'm, my skin color may look similar to somebody, but my experience socioeconomically and internationally and all that might be very different from someone sitting next to me who grew up in a different environment than I did. And, and all those experiences inform how we look and synthesize the information that's presented to us, uh, how we communicate, uh, how we interpret our natural world, and, and I think that's what brings the richness. So I, I would vote to not uh, be so fixated on just the appearances, although that could be a clue and an indicator, um, uh, but there may be uh, much more diversity in people who are even of the same gender uh, or the same ethnic group than, than we might know. It's, it's just being aware of, you know, kind of who you are as an individual and if you have a team, um, how do you enrich that team with people that perhaps come from a different place? You know, it might make you feel a little uncomfortable, it might make you feel that, you know, well they just don't get it. But sometimes if you just listen really carefully, you'll find things. I mean, I'm discovering that in my own organization now and it's working out just wonderfully. So uh, you do have to take a risk at that. But um, I think you do have a responsibility to acknowledge first, you know, who are, who are you surrounding yourself with? I mean, I get, I get, um, I'm sorry, I tell you, I get in trouble. When I see the, when I see certain missions and I see, you know, the launch control room of some missions, you know, and I'm, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, we haven't changed much since the Apollo days. It's like, what, what happened? But yet, you know, I know that that's probably a diverse group in their own right, so I have to be careful not to get fixated on just the visuals. But yet, the visuals in some ways are what some people mentioned earlier, sometimes they matter. People don't see 
people like themselves in that environment are like, well, that's for them and you know those people kind of thing. So anyway, other can, questions? Can I tack on to uh, that, uh, yeah, that, sure, what, what she Thank was you. talking about? Because I do think that there's something to say about um, Harvard Business Review has done, if you read that, there are a lot of studies on making smarter decisions. And I think one of the things we have to highlight is there are certain biases um, endemic to everyone. And if you pick a group of people that are just like you, no matter how you cut that cookie, then you are endangered, uh, in, endangering your decision from being the most rich and innovative that it can be. And so the studies that come out that Dr. Ward probably could talk uh, more intelligently than I can, we have to highlight those and so that people know when you're doing technology, when you're making big executive decisions, whatever it is, you want that richness. If you want to go to another planet, if we're ever going to be in, in a multi-planet species, we have to have that diversity of thought so that the problems that we may not conceive of ourselves, other people from different backgrounds, do think about those and we can together collectively solve those issues. So those are the things you have to highlight with regard to should I pick a group that looks and thinks exactly like me or do I want everyone's opinion? So kind of to address that. Yes, over on the left, please. Good Thank morning. Uh, Good Richard morning. Harris from Northeast University and my colleague, Rochelle Reisberg. Um, one of the key things I just wanted to add but also ask a question is we're talking about inspiration, but there's also the issue of preparation for many of our young people. And someone talked about the K through 12 pipeline. And I can tell you emphatically that many of our uh, inner city urban, uh, even uh, Appalachian Mountain uh, parents don't know what that pathway is, where they need to be by eighth grade in terms of uh, uh, algebra in order to be able to get to calculus by 12th grade. So there's this trajectory that isn't fully communicated and that in and of itself automatically starts to steer that child away from this possibility and having to then be redirected later on to maybe go to a community college or go through some remedial uh, effort. So I think yeah. that's one of the key things. We've got to find a way to get that message out clearly because many of the colleges and universities in the states, I should say, for high school diplomas say you need three years of math, two years of a science, three years of English, but that could be algebra, geometry one, I mean algebra one, geometry, and algebra two, and that's it. Yeah. And you're done. Yeah. So I think that's one of the connections. I'd like to acknowledge my Latina sister from Honduras, Hola. but this speaks to, again, <laughs> meeting these young people where they are. Uh, I heard a professor speak at the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, and he says within the Latino community, he's amazed at the number of young people that don't see themselves as scientists and engineers. Yeah. They don't see this part of their culture. Yeah. But he says it's in the blood, mm -hmm. the Mayans, the Incas, the Aztecs. So again, meeting people and children where they are, that anthropological, cultural dynamic. And so the last thing to the gentleman here that spoke about how do we connect these mundane realities as engineers. As a young engineer, when I worked in industry, I helped save the world. I had the chance to work in a hybrid microelectronics subassembly organization, but then President George H.W. Bush signed the Montreal Protocol and said, we have five years to eliminate our use of ozone depleting chemicals in order to address this issue about the ozone layer. And so for me, that's where I played a role in a bigger mission. And I had the opportunity to at least now see that I could make a difference, not just in my space, but even in how it impacted globally. So I, I asked the question as to how do we get this message out to parents? And to me, it should be part of a public announcement, a PA that goes out every weekend, every year. Maybe NASA features at the end of every space movie here is a message on how you can apply. These are the key things that you need to consider to go on to math with The Martian and all these other movies. So I'm hearing these kind of unique opportunities, but we've got to find a way to develop a systems approach and create the linkages. And as a father, three sons and a daughter, third grade education mother, right, coming from Honduras myself, understood the value of making sure advocacy but knowledge is essential for advocacy. And so these parents oftentimes don't have the knowledge 
on how to advocate. So I would ask, how can we move to that next stage to empower these parents who oftentimes may only just be a third grade education like my right. mother was, yeah. but she had enough knowledge to know what to advocate on my behalf. Well, your point's very well taken, and I, I think that you know we're going to continue to look at many of the things that we're doing. We're beginning to expand beyond just the outreach to the educators uh, and to the students and learners, but to, as to the parents and families of many of their programs include that. But I think your point really underscores the importance of that. Just because they may not have the knowledge or awareness doesn't mean they don't have the commitment to their children and all of that. So I, I appreciate and thank you for that. We have time for one more question. I want to get one more in, and then we're going to end on time, true NASA fashion. So Deborah, I'm looking at Deborah right here. Oh, I'm sorry, did I miss? I can't, the Is lights okay? blocked me out. Okay, we'll do two more, I lied. <laughs> yes, quick, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Magda Lagudas. I come from Texas A&M University. And I would like to ask a question that shifts the focus a little bit into the students we bring into the university and how we can retain and graduate more of the females and the ethnic minorities. We are investing a significant amount of resources across the country for what we call entrepreneurial mindset. This is a question for Susan and the rest of the panel. What do you see the role of the universities in using the excitement that NASA brings and cultivating that mindset so they can go to NASA and other universities and lead the innovation that we have been talking about our economy needs? Thank you. Perfect. Well, um, and I also want to bring in the point and the question that, that you made earlier about um, K through 12 preparation and parents. I think that um, the mechanisms, NASA, that you guys have in place um, for outreach and alliances is, um, is one avenue that I think can be made clear for, for those of us that are not within NASA mm -hmm. um, to really understand how can we be part of the conversation. And I say this because uh, community colleges, for example, are a great resource and local community organizations that are catalysts um, and really have the, the finger on the pulse of the community, the needs, the parents, the, the citizens that are in their local, their local area. Um, so creating more collaborations and partnerships with community colleges and, and with catalysts like Girls Who Code, um, in black girls who code, um, accelerators. Um, accelerators are a great feeder um, and incubators and co-working spaces where you will find more women and minorities um, that are trying to launch ideas and startups and innovation. Um, but these community organizations, um, I know like the mayor's office in Atlanta, for example, has been very active in, in creating a lot of diverse multidisciplinary alliances and collaborations so that it'll get to the parents which in turn uh, create a support system for the kids to go to camps, to go to STEM camps, to go to coding camps, so the parents know also uh, what role they can play in supporting their kids. Um, and for, for the universities, I think that there is an opportunity also to flip some of the model uh, to create more of a personalized learning experience for the students, as well as engagement for faculty and deans um, that are here, for example, have an immersive experience. Uh, may, maybe many of you have already had an immersive experience here at NASA as part of a mission or um, at really incredible conferences or programs. So if you can pass the mic um, to your students um, and let them now drive the conversation, let them drive what the classroom, what the work plan, what ideas could look like, um, get their buy-in as the early adopters of what their future is gonna look like. Uh, I know it requires a lot more work on the part of the faculty and the administration office of the universities, but really having that interest and engagement of the future of the student, can you find opportunities for them? Can you find uh, projects, work projects, internships abroad or internships with, with local areas that will, that will immerse them in conversations on science and tech? Are they building robots? Are they at labs? Do they understand what it means to 3D print a liver? Um, what the policy implications are? Are they connected to their history and their heritage? That's why um, you know, history majors, history professors, anthropologists, we all have a place to play in the growth of, the, of a future scientist because we can tell them where they've come from um, and, and that they can identify with a, with a scientist as well. But I think reversing the model at a university and also engaging 
us. Um, like, I, and the Pathways program was, was really great, and it's for a very, a very specific group. What outside of that, if you're not a student, um, if you're a mom or if you're a caretaker at home, but you have kids that want to be involved, how can they get involved? Um, what, what is the pathway for them, the ones that are outside the lines? But they're the ones that we want to bring in uh, the team. So um, it, it, it's just sort of, we don't have all the ideas ourselves, um, but if we engage the people we're targeting to, to actually tell us what some of the solutions they would want, and then us as educators, deans, faculty, organizations, then CEOs, then we're in charge of bringing the resources and creating and remodeling the structure to fit what they need in order for them to have level up and for them to really have a success um, in their experience and future growth. All right, I successfully burned through my schedule margin, but I did promise Deborah, do you want to you want to continue in the hallway if you want to do that? But you, I'll let you have the last word. Thank you so much. We're all watching the Olympics, and we're watching and knowing that most of these people who become very expert, not all, but most of the people who become very, very skilled in their field are starting at incredibly young ages. Yeah. yeah. So I think the longer this conversation has gone on this morning, the closer and closer we've gotten to the issue, and that is, as Mr. Woodfork said, you know, going on down to those younger years, finding those people before they fall off the math truck in the seventh or eighth grade or for some social reason or for some economic reason, as, as she has said, you know, you've got to start with the parents. So in the programs that we have at the NASA Visitor Center at Marshall Space Flight Center, Space Camp, it's an internationally known program. We've done now 750,000 people through that program. And I become more and more convinced as we do them that younger is where we need to go. Younger, younger, younger. I, our metrics show us that two out of three people who come through Space Camp end up in a STEM field. Some of that is pre-selection, of course, because parents like you send your children to places like that. But the fact is, if we could find a way for those youngest children, the very youngest ones, the same age we start the athletes, the same age the Russians start their athletes, at two and three and four and five years old, by the time they've come to middle school, to elementary school, to middle school, they've made those decisions. How many of us in this room knew from the time we were whatever little that we wanted to be, that met Katie Coleman, you know, that met someone who was exciting and that set your path at that age. So I'm very interested in dialogue with all of you and anything you would have to add about the very youngest child and how we inspire them. And I wanna to bring to everyone's attention the notable work that um, Kristen Erickson has done in the planetary group with a, with a new cartoon show called Space Racers. It's on public television, it is for pre-K children and quite good, and NASA's investing as well in that program. So I'm interested in dialoguing both here and afterwards and in any information any of you have about bringing that youngest child to bear before we lose them, even in elementary school, middle school, high school, for social and educational opportunity reasons. Great. Thank you. Well, with that charge, we're going to close this panel. Thank you, Deborah, for that. I appreciate it very much. And again, thanks, my panelists, for this great conversation. I appreciate it a lot. I think Omega's gonna dismiss us for our break. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you all for this engaging and inspirational conversation this morning to our distinguished panel. Um, we have a slight change in the uh, schedule this morning. We, um, our break will, um, we were scheduled, to, we are now scheduled to take our break from 10.30 to 10.45, but we're starting a little late, so we'll get, um, we'll come back at 10.50. Is that, that good? Okay, we'll start the next session at 10.50. Thank you.